Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Mind Castle podcast. I'm here with my brother, Reagan Schrock, and I'm Austin Schrock. We talk about things that we are learning and books we are reading and general areas of growth and change in our lives that we want to share with other people because if it helped us, maybe it can help other people. So we've been kind of on this uh, series of essentialism, um, which is a really fantastic book that we would highly recommend. It'll be linked down in the show notes. Um, But today we're going to continue our conversation about that. We have uh, done two episodes on it so far. The first one was just kind of laying out what is it. Second one was looking at the first couple parts of the book. Uh, or the first part of the book um, and some of the very practical aspects of putting some of the the teachings into practice. Uh, And so we're going to continue to build on that with this episode and hopefully cover either the next one or if we have time, the next two, which would finish out the book. Um, Kind of unlikely, but you know, miracles still happen. So um, we're going to go ahead and jump right into that. If you haven't listened to the other ones, I highly recommend listening to those just because we explain what it is. So we're not going to really recap it in this episode. We're just going to jump in. Um, But yeah, I guess a very quick explanation is essentialism is basically the discipline to pursuit of less, Um, not just less in general, but less of what is not really that important um, and more of what is most important. Um, So narrowing are focused down a bit. So anyway, uh, Regan has the book and the notes. I'm still reading it. Um, but Regan, go ahead and I guess jump into where we left off with the next one. Oh, quick disclaimer. Last episode, we talk about caffeine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so what? So, um, so, okay. So, so I was going on about we made caffeine. A slight error. I said the max do- or the recommended maximum dosage for caffeine in a day is 300 milligrams. Correct. What is it actually? Did you Google it's it? It's actually 400. Oh, <laughs> I was like, so it's close. Okay. So someone 10 cans of soda of Coca-Cola Whoa. or two. <laughs> <laughs> no. who, who would do that? <laughs> That's going to kill you from actually, the sugar. But fast fact, I worked with a fellow who'd drink literally a 12 pack of Mountain Dew every day. Oh my word. And I was like, you're going to die. And he's that's, like, nah, I'll be fine. I was like, I was a few years ago. Really, he actually might be dead. Like, uh, it's got to it's, it's destroy you. So anyways, that will so actually kill you. But, um, um, so anyway. okay, but I will say I have 100%. I know I've read numbers around 300 to 350, <laughs> but we'll go with 400. I think those are anecdotal. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind that. Wait, what website is that? I, Mario, Mayo, Mayo Clinic. Oh, Mayo Clinic. Okay, well, that, that, <laughs> that does seem fairly reputable because it has clinic in the name. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, now that we got that out of the and way. Now we got that out of the way. Let's the jump point in. being, if you drink one monster, it's like 300 milligrams of caffeine. Right. Boom, all at once. Yeah. Which is bad. Then you feed a bar of chocolate, you're basically toast. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Don't harsh on chocolate. I like chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate's great. Chocolate has properties in it that actually help you focus. Yeah. Like besides just the caffeine, like exactly. the cocoa. So yeah. If you want to be productive, just grab a chocolate bar. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, there is, there has some truth. There actually, some, <laughs> no, there's some truth to that there. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so, uh, where were we when the lights went out, as they say, um, here we go on to the regular regular scheduled program. <laughs> um, but no, the, the point being at the last episode we were talking about, um, how do we discern the trivial many from the vital few? And mm. one of those was this whole concept of taking care of ourselves, protecting the asset, as, right. you, as you want to say. And they, he was saying mostly about sleep, but then we kind of got on this thing with caffeine and overall mm-hmm. health, which is, is a really, really, really big deal. It's so foundational to, mm-hmm. to our lives. But to rewind, part one of the book is the essence. So basically what what is essentialism? So we'd spend an episode on that. Part two is explore, discerning. How do we mm-hmm. figure out what's really important uh, apart from what all the noise, basically? Mm-hmm. And then part three is the next step in the process. Saying, okay, so we've decided, we've explored what is trivial, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and we figured out what the vital few things are in life that I really, like I really care about. This is what I'm going to focus on. How do we go about eliminating all the trivial stuff? Mm. So we can make all the decisions all day long. And I do this a lot, but then actually doing the grunt work of saying, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to eliminate these things. That's actually for me. And I think for a lot of people where it gets really hard, because it's Mm. not just Mm. ethereal stuff anymore. It's not just the concept of essentialism. It's not just doing the discernment process and journaling. Oh, Mm. these are the Mm. things I don't want in my life. And well, yeah, but now the hard work. Yeah. And this is where it gets really complicated because if you're a human, um, <laughs> you do tend to interact with other humans. <laughs> so a lot of the things that are trivial or or have stretched us too thin and are not part of that vital few that we need to keep mm. have to do with commitments to that involve other people. 
And this is where it can get really, yeah. really difficult. It's yeah. like really hard because obviously it's important to be kind and not mm-hmm. offend people and do not drop the ball and be responsible and mm-hmm. keeping your word. These are really important, but you may have committed to, I'm going to grab lunch with so-and-so, or I'm going to do this project for this person. I'm going to take on this extra thing because while well, this person wants me to, I'm going to mow so-and-so's lawn, like all these. And those may be really good things. But you may come to the realization like, hey, uh, you know what? I actually can't mow so-and-so's lawn because I need to spend more time with my kids. Well, now you have to let so-and-so down and say, hey, mm-hmm. I can't do, you know, I can't do this thing I committed to. This, this is where it gets really complicated. And each yeah. person kind of has to work their way through that. I'm a huge, huge, like if you commit to something, you need to see it through to the best of your ability if you mm-hmm. can, just because otherwise you make a lot of enemies. <laughs> um, and that just you know, that's a principle of Jesus really, you know, mm-hmm. you say you're new, you know, your guess is yes, your no is no. Um, so that's a core value. So the key is this can take some time, but you start building it a lifestyle of saying no to all future things <laughs> that don't fit <laughs> basically. And over time it will pivot from maxed and spread too thin to the other way. Mm-hmm. And I've started doing this in my own life this year. And it's been like awesome because like suddenly you have all this space. So all that to say, we're going to get into the elimination phase. And the very first one is chapter 10 clarity. Clarity is like, a, like essentially becoming a core value for me. I just, <laughs> I want things. We talk about this in the communication episode. Yep. Simple, clear, concise clarity, man. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you don't have clarity on your life and what you're doing, who boy, a lot of things don't work. Um, so it's basically, he starts with the tagline to one decision that makes a thousand. He's so mm-hmm. true. If you mm-hmm. have clarity around things, this is something I use when I'm working with nonprofits or or teams and stuff. Um, there's a lot of material that I, that I pulled from here. And so here we go. I'm going to read a section. Let's start with a game. On the next page are mission statements from three companies. Try to match each company with its mission statement. <laughs> this is just so funny. Mission statement, profitable growth su- through superior customer service, innovation, quality, and commitment. <laughs> Another one, to be the leader in every market we serve to the benefit of our customers and our shareholders. Another one, the company's primary objective is to maximize long-term stakeholder value while adhering to the laws of the jurisdictions in which it operates and at all times observing the highest ethical standards. <laughs> like, oh, pff, like that could literally be any company in the world. Like th- those are just so vague. <laughs> Turns out they're all fairly major cor- corporations, as he says. Um, if you had absolutely no idea how to solve this puzzle, you are not alone, he says. <laughs> The largely indistinguishable statements make the task almost impossible. Such vague, inflated mission statements may still be considered quote-unquote best practice in some circles, but in many cases, they do not achieve what they are intended to achieve, which Mm -hmm. is to inspire their employees with a clear sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. If you work for a company like that, it's like, well, it's, 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 you know, it's so vague. Um, So especially in the nonprofit world, you run into this even more because they'll make these lofty things of like, we're going to change the world or whatever. You know, it's so (laughs) vague. Where's the clarity? Yeah. So when it comes to eliminating things, having concrete, clear, this is, this is what we're going for. Very definite. It's got to be concrete, not this ethereal, whatever, whatever stuff. Suddenly the decisions are much, much, much easier to make. Mm -hmm. You actually write those goals down. You say, this is what I'm trying to do. This is where I'm going. Um, And I have a whole thing I teach and go through with, with people on this. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun because it can be almost revolutionary actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, Yeah, definitely. Because people, people that have never really had that clarity, all of a sudden when they figure out how to get it, it can be like, Oh man, it's, it's exciting. Like it's really, really exciting. It's like a superpower basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know? Um, so this is what he says about in- essential intent or basically what, what there's a whole bunch here we're skipping over, but he calls the essential intent and essential intent is both inspirational and concrete, both meaningful mm-hmm. and measurable. Mm-hmm. If you can't measure it, how do you know if you're working towards your goals? How do you know if this yeah. project fits? Like if you haven't figured out how to measure Okay, back to, you know, mowing your neighbor's lawn or whatever. Like if your essential intent is, I mean, I want to spend more time with my family. That's a pretty concrete, pretty meaningful, pretty mm-hmm. actionable, pretty inspirational. Like it fits all those boxes. And it's like, well, if I say, if that is the goal, and it's very clear. And Bubba says, hey, can you mow my, my lawn this evening? It's like, actually, no, because I've already made this very clear that I, I'm going to do this instead. I'm going to be mm-hmm. hanging out with my kids tonight or whatever. Then it's like super easy. That's hardly even a choice. It's like, well, no, like I would yeah. love to, but like, I can't mm-hmm. because this other thing I've decided is more important, mm-hmm. even though helping out your neighbor or whatever may be 
excellent and awesome. And you should maybe in other circumstances, of course, uh, you know, in that case, the decision's already been made. Mm. There's no ambiguity yeah. there. It's not vague at all. But what's hard, I'm going to jump in here. Mm-hmm. What's hard is, is, is people, people make everything into a crisis because they're, they, they like, like if you make something urgent and a crisis, you're like, you're way more likely to get someone to actually help you. And that's where like, it's so hard to do this sometimes when the person, you know, that you're saying no to is quote in a crisis mode and like, they need your help, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And it's just like, it's really, really hard to say no to that sometimes. I mean, it's about to prioritizing. <laughs> it is. Your ability well, to prioritize like, is, <clears throat> is absolutely essential in these kinds of, because here's the thing. There's right now in our local community, there's always crises going, crises, crises like that, that are happening all the time. Exactly. And so if you make yourself the only person who can solve those, you know, you, you will never have a life because you just mm-hmm. be running from, and there will be very good things. You'll be helping people like absolutely. But at some point, you just can't <laughs> like yeah. you can't do you can't yeah, you literally fix everybody can't. and so you have to then you have to choose because you here's the thing because you could make that call but you better be prepared to explain it really well <laughs> yeah because someone else looking at that be like are you serious like why yeah. are you not helping like blah 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 you know valid question right and that's where if you have clarity around the core values and the yeah, things that exactly. you're trying to do and they've got to be legit like they got to make right. sense then you can explain to that person and say, well, here's, here's what I'm actually trying to do. Mm-hmm. Like there've been a lot of things that I've like that. So, uh, you know, nonprofit, I mean, we go mm-hmm. to Iraq and Iraq and you know, there's a million and a half refugees mm-hmm. around the city where we have several bases. How do you choose who you're going to help? Yeah. They, everybody needs help mm-hmm. literally. And you can't, you can't possibly help them all. So yeah, you have to have, very clear Mm -hmm. this is how we're going to do it and here's why and this have to be really good reasons and you have to be prepared to change them Mm -hmm. because as you collect more information get more data on the situation you will change some things and which has happened a lot like Mm -hmm. over the years we're like you know initially we're oh we're going to help widows in this and this and this way oh that actually didn't work really good you know oh it'd be better if we did it in this and this way oh cool Mm -hmm. and we can help you even more and then right but then even then you have to decide, well, which ones are you going to help? Cause there's thousands yeah. of them, you know, Oh, it's that, that can get really stressful. Yeah. Um, and, and the stakes are pretty high. Cause then they'll right. have, there was one time we were in a refugee camp and this lady was kind of just weeping, you know, of like, Oh, you know, I need so much help. I've lost my, you know, my husband is, is over with ISIS and like, we're stuck and blah, 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 all this stuff. And it was just like, I mean, we were only there for a day. Like there was nothing we could really do. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe there was, but we would have had to change a bunch. It, it would have been really, really hard. Yeah. There was a language barrier. Um, but those are hard things, yeah. you know, and you have to learn to, to live with that stuff. Um, and, and, you know, m- most people are probably not going to have something quite that yeah. dramatic. But, right. but this, the, the principle is still the same. The, yeah. Um, it, it, it comes back to that clarity. And like, yeah. if you don't have that, then it makes those decisions so, so hard. And also just, Yeah it damages people a lot more if you don't have that clarity. It'll eat you up you know? the rest of your life. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. something that heavy definitely would, but for oh, most yeah. people, yeah. It, you know, it just might mean you damage a, a relationship that you later have to mend or work through later or something. That's hardly worth that. You know, you don't, yeah. really, you don't really want to do that, you know, if, if at <laughs> yeah. all possible, which, and that was one of the other things he said, um, going back to the book, he said, you know, how will we know when we have succeeded? Yeah. So like it needs to be something that you, you've set these are the parameters. Here's mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do. And it's clear enough right. that you can actually say when you've succeeded at it, it's way easy to be ambiguous, you know, have a lot of ambiguity and make these nice inspirational statements of we're going to change the world. Okay. How will you know when you succeed? <laughs> you know, that's a little vague, yeah. um, but it's really easy to go down that street. And I, f- I catch myself doing this all the time. So mm-hmm. make things as clear as you can. It comes back to the communication, simple, clear, concise. Um, yeah. It, and once you have that, uh, you're, I'd say, yeah, you, you've made a lot of the hard work is done Yeah, at that point. Um, is that kind of where he goes in the book or where, like, where does he move from that section? Like, does he go to values and stuff? Well, no, I was a little surprised, which you can get that at other, other, um, other books, you know, going to, you know, what are your core values? Which mm. we, again, we, we mentioned this multiple <laughs> times. We need to do an episode on that because that, that's immensely for me. They would fit in this chapter more than anything at the chapter on clarity. Yeah hugely clarifying like mm-hmm. if you can figure out what your core values are like so much in life just 
falls together. Because mm-hmm. you, at a glance, can be like, does that fit my core values? Might be a really good thing, but no, doesn't fit. Like, um, here's one that I considered at one point was getting into local EMS, you know, mm. firefighting, EMT, something like that. Yeah. Um, and I bounced that around. I tried some different things that, you know, getting different certifications and whatever. And then I started doing a little more of a deep dive on my core values. And I realized as good of a thing that is, and please, if you're out there and you can get into EMS, like do it. It's awesome. We need those mm-hmm. people. But I realized that doesn't fit with where I'm trying to go. Yeah. I'm trying to do, you know, stuff in the Middle East, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that doesn't really fit with right. trying to do something here locally. Um, so I had to make that choice. But then in the end, when I, once I made the choice, because I had those core values nice and clear, it was very easy for me. Mm -hmm. Whereas before that it had kind of been eating me up and I felt bad that I was, well, I should, you know, I should be on the local search and rescue team or something. I could Mm -hmm. at least do that. Right. And I almost joined, (laughs) you know, and I'm like, no, actually I'm really glad I didn't because then if I just said yes to that, I would have been saying no to maybe, you know, that trip to Iraq where we, you know, did this thing and helped these other people. And it made that really easy. And then the next person, you know, there's someone in our church and did the other way. And he was like, I'm going to go all in on, you know, EMS. And it's like, mm-hmm. awesome. And then you can do that. And now that person is probably not going <laughs> to, you know, be whatever, right. hauling people out of rubble, you know, from the earthquakes in Morocco, which just happened or whatever it might be. Um, okay. So let's, let's keep moving on. So the next phase, once you have that, that clarity, the stuff we've been saying, the next part is where it gets even harder. And you've already talked about this, um, saying no to things. Th- this one's really hard because to make this work, you have to know how to say no, mm. <laughs> but you need to be able to do it in a way that isn't mean or isn't condescending or isn't, um, Oh, my life is so much more important that I can't <laughs> possibly do, you know, whatever. <laughs> if um, you knew what I was doing, <laughs> I mean, if you just understood how busy and how important I am and that I do not have time, oh, you we know? need to go through the book called, uh, the little prince. It's so it, great. Is it kind of like that? It's yeah. kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. It's it. So it's really easy to, I've done this so much in the past. Someone emails you and says, Hey, do you have time to chat about blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, it's right on the line of like, that could be really interesting. I could maybe help them out. It kind of fits with what I'm trying to do. And so you send an email back, like, well, I'll see, you know, what, what options do you have? I'll consider it. And then it drags on and on and on in this email <laughs> thread. And eventually you kind of realize like, I really don't have time. It doesn't really fit with what, mm-hmm. what I'm trying to do. And you know, you feel really bad. You know, it'd have been so much better <laughs> in that initial email to be like, Hey, I would love to but I simply can't because of other commitments in my life. But Hey, you talk to this person over here. They might be yeah. able to help you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then boom, it's over. It's done. The, the person's happy. Cause you responded. You were very clear. There's no ambiguity. You mm. said no. So there's yeah. no question of like, well, maybe in the future and you kind of drag it on and kind of lure them along, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, so, and you offered a solution. You said, Hey, I can't, but contact Bubba, you know, maybe he knows mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, and I've done that a ton. I literally just did that a few weeks ago where someone was like, Hey, can I have a zoom call about, something with refugees in the Middle East. And I was like, Hey, I'm, you know, on sabbatical right now. So it's not going to work, but talk to this person. And so mm-hmm. they called that person up. They had a great chat, got the answers he needed. Everybody's happy. And if mm-hmm. I had been like, ah, oh, well, I'll see if I can get to that. It would probably dragged on for months. Yeah. You know? And then it never would have happened. And the person probably would have got kind of mad. Don't do that. So that's what he, he calls it the graceful. No, mm. it's still no, but it said very kindly <laughs> <laughs> dare to say no firmly, resolutely and gracefully. And then say yes to only things that matter. Um, Mm -hmm. So saying no is really hard. We all know it. We all struggle with it, but you just, you just got to, you know, find find one thing in your life today that you're just kind of, well, you know, and it's just kind of dragging on (laughs) and you haven't really committed. It's just kind of, and and just say, just boom, just just send that email and say, Hey, I I really cannot get Mm -hmm. to this. (laughs) Actually a really good one. I saw I emailed uh, (laughs) him. This is going to sound. Like I'm so big and important. I, I emailed my lawyer the other day. <laughs> no, it's a lawyer friend of mine. I needed some legal advice on something really simple. Nothing crazy. Don't worry. I'm not getting sued or anything, but it was just <laughs> emailed him. Great fella. And, and I say, Hey, we're working on this project. I need some counsel to make sure we get the wording right. So that, you know, we're, we're covering our bases because of X, Y, Z. And he immediately responded, which is so nice and said, I am booked for this month. Can you email me back? on this date and remind me and I'll take care of it. And I was like, Oh, wow. So (laughs) kind. Like, that's awesome. Instead of him being like, well, I'll see if I can get to it. And he takes him three weeks to respond and blah, blah, blah. No, he's just like, boom, like really nice, very gracious said, here's the deal. 
And I was like, great. And I set a reminder on my phone. I emailed him on that date and he responded immediately with exactly what I needed. Problem solved. Oh, mm. it was so nice. It's like, that is professional right there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, note that for yourselves. But Do you anyways. want me to read the uh, Mihai cheeks at Mihai uh, to Peter uh, Drunker? Yeah, read it. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm at a loss. So, um, <laughs> let me see if I can get this. There's a lot of big words in here, so give me a second here. Um, basically, this is an example of how it can be kind of awkward to say no to people, but a really good example of of uh, me high cheek sent me high. I think that's how I say that. Mm-hmm. He's the guy that came up with flow and all of that. Oh, dude, the go- um, he's like from Czechoslovakia or yeah, something. something. Yeah, like that. a really cool. Anyway, name. he's yeah. emailing uh, Peter Drug- Drucker. Drucker, uh, who's really, really big into the productivity and essentialism and all that. Um, and he's asking him to, you know, something about like creativity or like just wants to like ask him some questions about the book he's writing. And, uh, Peter's response is very interesting. Um, wait, no. Okay. So Peter responds and says, <laughs> I'm greatly honored and flattered by your kind words of February 14th for I have admired you and your work for many years and I have learned much from it. But my dear professor, Mikchek, I can't say that word. But it's like itself. a 12 letter Mihai long. Cheek sent me high. Um, uh, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. I could not possibly answer your questions. I'm told I am creative. I don't know what that means. I just keep on plotting. I hope that you don't think of me as presumptuous or rude if I say that one of the secrets to productivity in which I believe, whereas I do not believe in creativity, is to have a very, all capital, very big waste paper basket (laughs) to catch all invitations such as yours. (laughs) Productivity in my experience consists of not doing anything that helps the work of other people, but to spend all one's time on the work that the good Lord has fitted one to do and to do it very well <laughs> so dude that was his response. savage i just i oh, love that it's, man it's so good <laughs> that is incredible you have a very big waste paper basket for invitations <laughs> such as yours <laughs> it's really but peter drugger is like i mean he's like a legendary yeah. i mean that guy wrote so many incredible books and so much on theory of management and industries mm-hmm. like he, he, he shaped so much of the management industry yeah uh, you can't we can hardly imagine a world without him really mm-hmm. and that's he would have been more like middle of the last century um really incredible okay that's that was good that was really good well there you go if you need a uh, <laughs> a form email to send to all those invitations <laughs> you're getting there you oh, go. Man. Uh, wow um okay so the next one so that was no but then you have the other option of or another way of doing this too is uncommitting from things cutting your losses basically mm. starts with a quote by josh billings no idea who that is half of the trouble uh, <clears throat> sorry half of the troubles of this life can be traced to, to saying yes too quickly and not saying no soon enough mm. cutting your losses is a tough as hard because mm-hmm. The sunk cost bias. Mm. (laughs) So sunk cost bias is the tendency to continue to invest time, money, or energy into something we know is a losing proposition simply because we have already incurred or sunk a cost that cannot be recouped. But of course, this can easily become a vicious cycle. The more we invest, the more determined we become to see it through and see our investment pay off. The more we invest in something, the harder it is to let go. The sunk cost, oh, this is a great example, okay, just to keep going here. The sunk cost for developing and building the Concorde, so the supersonic um, air, airliner, it was the only one mm. ever built. Incredible, by the way. The sunk cost for developing and building the Concorde were around $1 billion, which is insane. <sighs> Yet the more money the British and French governments poured into it, the harder it was to walk away. <laughs> Individuals are equally vulnerable to sunk cost biases. So the Concorde, every time it flew, it lost money. So the Whoa. more they flew, the more money they lost. Whoa. Which is insane. That's not good. <laughs> no, not good at all. And so they're like, well, well, if we could just, you know, scale this program and, uh, you know, uh, get, get cost down and, and keep doing R&D on this thing and, you know, just keep flying and eventually we'll get there. And over time, it'll make money. That's what they kept saying. Over time, it'll make money. And so every time they flew and they flew it more and more, the more money they lost. <laughs> <laughs> Sun cost fallacy. And so the program went for years. Losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money. Because like, well, we've already invested a billion dollars to build this thing. Like, it would be awful to stop now. And and in the end, I mean, it mm. ended up costing just a insane amount of money. Now, wow. 
really awesome aircraft and it's so <laughs> cool. They built it and they demonstrated some really neat, you know, um, principles, uh, you know, in, in aerodynamics, but, mm. uh, yeah, probably not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another really good example is the moon rocket that NASA currently has. Mm. They developed it a long time ago and while well, they're like, well, we'd already sunk so much money into this thing. We need to finish it and launch the thing, even though it's like 30 years out of date, Oof. you know, and they just launched it last year and it's like, I mean, that's cool and all, but like, we've got way better systems now, but they're like, well, but, but we have this thing. Like, we kinda have, I mean, and you got to feel bad for them. It's like, well, we have to at least launch it. Right. I mean, it's just sitting here. It's, so it's, yeah. Sunk cost fallacy. We've been working for 35 years in this stupid rocket. <laughs> uh, so the point being even the smartest minds in the world, NASA or Concord engineers, brilliant people fall into this trap mm -hmm. of sunk cost fallacy to serious, serious mm -hmm. expense. Mm -hmm. And we can do this all the time as individuals. Oh, I've already put so much into this project. I've already said I would do this thing. And like, ah, you know, I really feel, and this is why you have to be careful. Like if you drop commitments, like your word, you said you will do something and you don't, that I, you have to be real careful with that. Cause mm -hmm. that becomes in my mind, a bit of an ethical thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd be amazed how many projects if you send a nice email to everybody else on the team and say, Hey guys, I'm really stretched too thin. I really don't feel like I should keep on with this project. Is that okay? Here's a few other solutions. If, if I step down, what do you guys think mm -hmm. and see what your team says? You'd be shocked how easy it is to get off of stuff. Actually. Mm -hmm. Like I started doing that and it was like, boom, boom, boom. Just like that. People will totally understand. Mm -hmm. They're like, Oh yeah. Hey, if this is going to free you up to do this other really important thing, go for it. Um, and so that actually like, really helped but mm. it can be hard because you're like oh i've worked with this team on on this thing for yeah. so long and like you know i don't want to leave and i'm oh, you know what will they do without me you know <laughs> they won't be able to make it without my amazing expertise and brilliant <laughs> mind and then you leave and the project does like 50 times better because you're not involved <laughs> so, oh no it's so embarrassing right it happens to me all the time um <laughs> so so yeah cut your losses it's mm -hmm. hard but cut your losses yeah i did mm. this with a credit card cut my losses Nice. It had all these nice bonuses and I was like, no, I don't need this. Cut the loss. Mm. Cause I was paying for it. It's like dumb. Don't do that. Anything on more on that? Um, no, the only thing I would mention is like, is what, like before you say no, sometimes it can be really good to evaluate if it's actually a crisis or not. Um, like, I don't know. Like I said, people tend to exaggerate things and make <laughs> stuff into a crisis just to, because they know that that'll help them get help which we all do that like because we want people to help us and sometimes it can just be really good to just ask a few probing questions and see like is there someone else that could do this is this actually a life or death situation here like or are you just like kind of you know exaggerating a little bit because mm -hmm. um, in the heat of, mo heat of the moment it's easy to do that uh, and so I found that really helpful and then you could actually offer help like you can mm -hmm. s offer solutions be like oh like you know really identify what's actually the problem here mm -hmm. and be like, Oh, okay. Well like this person over here could help you out. Or like, you know, you actually have a couple months to do this. Like it's not a now kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So I found that really helpful. It just makes saying no a little bit easier because you can, they feel heard because yeah. you've spent time to actually listen and, and identify and, and be like, okay, like this is the problem. Here's what we're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. I can't help, but I can't do this kind of thing. Yeah, that's interesting because I just had a situation like that actually. Well, a couple of months ago, where it was like, oh my goodness, here's this this family in Iraq and they're like starving and all these other people are depending on them. And there's like hundreds of people involved in this big network and it's this huge crisis and we need to send them money right now, like right now, today. <laughs> Every time I hear that, I'm like, okay, mm what's going on here? Because mm -hmm. I knew who this family was and I was like, they're not starving. Like, I, I know that factually they're not, oh, well, but other people they know are and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, we're not there. We don't know all these other people, like what's going on. And, and so I was just kind of hedging a little bit. And this was someone else who's not part of our organization or whatever. And so he was, you know, going around trying to, trying to get, you know, raise money and try to get this mm. thing figured out. And, and then finally he asked me, cause I don't just <laughs> spout stuff unless people ask, but he was like, well, what, what would you do? What do you think? I was like pulled a Chris Voss and I was like, can I be real honest with you? He's like, yeah, yeah. I really want to know. Cause I don't know what I'm doing. He, you know, he's just, mm. he's not, hasn't lived there. And I said, I, I wouldn't send him any money. Cause like he was going to get a personal loan. He was actually going to go to the get a loan and send it to them. And I was like, I wouldn't do that. You're not over there. And there, there was a lot more complicated yeah. stuff involved. I, I've been to Iraq a lot of times and I, you know, I'd been talking to some other people in it 
And, and I said, I just, just hold off. Nobody's starving to death. I can be very confident of that. This is not a crisis. Let's, mm. let's get some more details here. Let's fly over there and actually meet them. Let's, let's figure yeah. this thing out. And so he didn't. And it, it all resolved itself, mm. you know, and, and, and it was like, woo, that was close, you know, and yeah. it was probably, there was a language barrier. There's probably some miscommunication. Mm. Who, who knows what all happened? I don't, I'm not blaming anybody. I mean, I know the situation may have been pretty intense for them over there, but it wasn't to the point where he needed to get another mortgage on his house. Like yeah. it, it was, you know, not that. And he had to, that was really hard. You yeah. know, he had to say no. He had to uncommit from some things, Oof. you know, and he had to say, okay, yeah, yeah, I need to walk this back. And if he wouldn't have, oh my goodness, because now he'd be committed to this whole thing and now he'd have to, I mean, it, it could have turned into just talk about a trivial many. I mean, man, it could have turned into something crazy. Yeah. Um, and maybe not, maybe it would have been fine. I've just seen this happen to a lot of people <laughs> in a lot of organizations because now you've committed to helping these people and oh my God, all the stress and stuff. Um, and it ended, up, it ended up working out fine. And, you know, and, and I was really glad, <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. it worked out for them, worked out for him. Um, it's glad to see that happen. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, well, there's, there's a couple more here and then, then we'll wrap this up. Um, the one that I want to note is he talks about editing out options or cutting out options. Mm. If you look at the Latin root word for decision, it literally means to mm -hmm. cut out or to yep. kill. Incision. Um, yeah. So if you look at possibilities, it's like, okay, I could choose this or this or this or this or this. So you have all these branches of possibility. And if you choose one of them, you make a decision. You killed all the others. <laughs> oh, I love that, man. Tell everybody. <laughs> That's genius. Uh, yeah. Language is so cool. Um, but it's, it's true. And, and there's some people that hate that. They're like, I want to keep all my options open. Mm. But at some point, that's a huge problem for, for my generation, oh, at least dude. like we yeah. love our options, man. But then you, then what's the flip side? <sighs> well, you never end up committing you to anything, never commit and, to anything. <laughs> and you do everything a little tiny bit and just, yeah, uh, but it's hard. I mean, you make mm -hmm. that decision, you make a call and now all the other possibilities are gone, mm -hmm. which is actually probably not that bad. Because yeah. usually there are very few things in life that you cannot walk back from. Right. Very, very few decisions are that monumental for your life. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and if you make a wrong call, you can almost always stop as long as you don't do sunk by a uh, sunk cost bias. <laughs> yeah. You can usually walk it back and say, I messed up. Try another one. And I think that's what gets us a lot of times. Um, and then limit. That's the last one. Um, the freedom of just setting boundaries. So once you've decided these are the things that really matter to me, these are the things I'm uncommitting from, I'm, I'm removing from my life, these are the things I'm saying no to, you start getting a really clear sense of where the boundaries are for your life, of what you want, not what mm -hmm. you, that sounds selfish, but the things that matter the most, yeah. the most valuable. And then as out of that, you build like these boundaries around it. Yeah, mm. These are my boundaries. And... And when stuff falls out of those boundaries, it's pretty easy to just be like, it doesn't fit. It's not a good fit. And there have been loads of options where people come to me with projects. Hey, can you help with this? We'd love to have your input on this and that. Sometimes I say yes, but most of the time I'm like, it, it falls out of the boundaries mm -hmm. of what I'm trying to do. So if I say yes to it, I'm saying yes to something. I know it isn't a very good fit. Yeah. I'm saying yes to a big time commitment. And as a result, everybody's going to be unhappy because they're going to be like, oh, he's not really that much help, honestly. <laughs> and like, I'm not going to be that good because it's not really where I'm trying to go in life. So I'm probably not even going to know that much about it. So I'm going to be a drag on the team. In the end, it feels bad to have that boundary. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's actually huge respect for them and for you. Right. And people, I've been blown away how people understand that. Yeah. If you simply say that, hey, mm -hmm. doesn't really fit with where I'm trying to go. They'll, they'll email back, but hey, thanks so much for considering it. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate you being honest. <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes they'll come back around like, hey, the last one didn't fit, but what about this one? And it's like <laughs> actually a really good fit. And it's awesome. I'm like, oh, yes, I would love to do that. Let's do that. And that literally just happened. I'm like going to West <laughs> Africa now with this group because like we stayed in contact about something that ended up not working. And then they came back with something that was a perfect fit for where I wanted mm -hmm. to go in life. And I was like, absolutely, let's do this project together. Um, and they hugely respected that. I respected them. It was, everybody wins. And now hopefully we haven't done it yet, but hopefully that project ends up being like, way better than anything else we could have done because it, it actually fit. And I had those boundaries, those hard limits set. Um, so, mm. which is a whole nother story. We could ooh, podcasting about West Africa, guys. <laughs> I'm going to West Africa. I'm so excited. It's going to be awesome. Little tiny country I'd never heard of before. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's about that big. Anyways. So right. how far are we on the book? <laughs> yeah, so we're at like 
like halfway. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One uh, more section, right? Uh, two more, actually. Two more. No, one more. You're right. One, one more. more. But this this is really important because this yeah. is where, where this book starts getting really practical and where it starts mm-hmm. getting really hard. Yeah. It's just really hard to write that email and say, I'm sorry, I can't. Because yeah. we hate disappointing people. Mm-hmm. Like we don't want to disappoint people. It's like baked into our mm-hmm. brains, you know? Yeah. That's why I'm reading this book pretty slow. <laughs> yeah. Taking it nice and slow. Yeah. But yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good, um, really good book. I would highly recommend it to people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably going to try to read it at least like every year or so. Cause it's just something we so quickly forget about what matters and taking time to define that. It's really hard. Mm-hmm. And that's, there's something too, to be said for like the sunk cost balance fallacy thing. That's, that's really hard because sometimes it actually is true. Like there is a tipping point in most things where like, if you do get over that little bit, it, it does start to even out and like, mm-hmm. it's hard to, that's when it's hard. Like, do you cut this off? Because do you, or do you know? hang with it for yeah. just a little bit longer, and you and then it'll kind of even out a bit. And that's hard. That's really hard to do. That's where you need a really good team around you. Yeah, and you don't generally want to make those decisions alone. It mm. depends on how significant. If it's a pretty minor thing, like should I cancel my Netflix or not? <laughs> Pro tip, cancel it. It's simple. <laughs> it's just, you don't need the extra 20 bucks a month. And, you know, watching Netflix is kind of lame when you could be doing cool stuff like, you know, yep. listening to this podcast. Right. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, whereas other things like, should I take this job or not? Or mm-hmm. should I leave this job or not? Those are big enough decisions. You really should be talking to mentors and mm-hmm. and people around you that you trust. Because getting, getting a little input from people that that have a, a pretty unbiased outside opinion is, yeah. is like gold. And we, I think we did a podcast on that mm-hmm. too, where it's like, it's one of the secret powers, yeah. you know, of very successful people is they have groups around them that they can ask advice from <laughs> at a moment's notice, be like, call up, you know, um, Herman and be like, yo, what, like, what, what do you think of this? And, and, you know, he may have some really good advice. Yeah. For everybody needs that. So basically we've done, we've done a podcast on basically everything at this point, <laughs> <laughs> everything we reference, well, like, you know what? We did a podcast on that. I think <laughs> podcast or YouTube video sugar, somewhere. Sugar coated lies, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. yeah, that's true. We yeah, have, wow. Podcasts from everything on donuts to uh, nuclear weapons, you know, to ice baths, to ice baths. Basically everything. Dude, the nuclear weapons one, though, is that still one of really my favorites. Good. I can't that wait to post that one. Wild. Wait, no, we did post that one. No, we haven't. Wait, which one? The one where he prevents World War Three. Yeah, we posted that one. Oh. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about that. It's one of our most listened to episodes. Oh. Because he, like, he saves the world, which is kind of cool, I, so most people listen to it. I stopped checking the analytics <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're kind of just rambling on we're here. Rambling. Um, next episode, hopefully, we'll finish this book up. And if you have enjoyed it or if you have questions about it, feel free to email us or reach out to us on our different platforms or websites, things like that. Um, all of the links for things we mentioned in the this episode can be found in the show notes, as well as our Goodreads. You can see what else we're reading. Um, you can follow us there. If you want to get scribbed, get a free month of audiobooks. You know, click the link down in the description. Mm-hmm. All kinds of fun stuff down there. And, Still trying to uh, get them to sponsor us, and they just they, they just won't. They won't. So it's like, come yeah. on, guys! You're like the coolest <laughs> audiobook platform in the world. Can you please? I sponsor think they have us. the sunk fallacy thingy. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're awesome. Oh, man. Come on. Yeah. I, I've, I've tried a couple times. Thank you guys for listening, uh, and we'll catch you in the next one.